Veer, if you were a young person today, yeah. would you still want to be a journalist? Well, about 10 years ago, when things were different from today, my son told me he was considering going into media. And I think the logical question would have been television, print. I said just one word, which is don't. Why? Because I think it's over. My parents were agnostics. Mm. I became a believer quite early. I now believe in God. I go to Hindu temples. I pray every single day. We have a puja room in our mm. house. My wife does an aarti every day, does lights a candle. So we are very clearly believers. Mm. So it's not that we can't communicate with people because we don't have faith. My point is that my kind of faith is very different from theirs. My kind of faith is I venerate my gods. I don't go out and kill Muslims just to say I'm being a good Hindu. That's, according to me, a complete perversion of Hinduism. Parallel with politics today is essentially Indira Gandhi without dynasty, but radical Hinduism. It's exactly the same way in which we, things are run. We forget that Mrs. Gandhi, even before the emergency, had subverted many of the institutions of governance. We talk now about what Rijuju is saying about the Supreme Court, which frankly is scandalous. But we forget there's nothing compared to what Indira Gandhi did to the Supreme Court, where she promoted people out of, uh, out of turn, where her favorites became Supreme Court judges. Do you believe Prime Minister Modi is bothered Oh, he's very bothered. By the Western press? Of course he is. How do you find Rahul Gandhi different from Sonia Gandhi? Only in the sense that I really don't know Rahul Gandhi. I think he's different from Sonia Gandhi in that he's a talker and he's not a listener. young person today, yeah. would you still want to be a journalist? Well, about 10 years ago, and when things were different from today, my son told me he was considering going into media. And I think the logical question would have been television, print. I said just one word, which is don't. Why? Because I think it's over. I think what we're seeing are the dying flickers of the media scene, at least the media scene we were part of. I think it's changed. There are many, many technological reasons, demographic reasons, whatever, but it's changed. I don't think 10 years from now, media as we know it now will still be around. The argument could be that media as we know it, because we're old, will no longer exist, but there will always be room for reporting and storytelling. You don't agree? Of course, there is always going to be room for everything. But the point is, how much room is there? And is it economically viable? Mm. Yeah. What has changed the most about journalism? In India or you mean globally? In India. In India, the fact that nobody does journalism for journalism's sake. Mm. There was always the danger in India that people who got into the media, and often there were large business houses, did it for reasons that were not well, mm. strictly journalistic. Mm. But it was always like a positive thing that you said that they're doing this, they're going to do stories for the government or against the government, depending on which licenses they get. So in its own way, as bizarre and strange as it sounds, the media, and here it means the owners rather than the editors, did act in what it perceived as being its own best interest. I think media now is just frightened. So it no longer perceives in any interest other than survival and living to see the next day. Is it... Or are we frightened of economic ruin? Are we frightened to lose access? Are we frightened of consequences that are more dire? What are we frightened of? I think losing access is actually the least of our worries. It's because people have, people have yeah. no access at the moment. But right? there are sections of the media there that are sections of the media have access to but, government. Yeah, but generally the rule of thumb is that if you want access, not only do your questions go in in advance and somebody writes them and gives them to the person, writes the answers and gives them to the person in question, but the person you're interviewing sits on the chair and the interviewer adopts the kneeling position. Now, that's not journalism, according to me, or interviewing. There is also an alternative extreme yeah. to the scenario you just painted. You talk of the supplicant journalist. There is also today in India, the activist journalist uh, who has entrenched sort of hatred um, for a certain kind of politics and believes it's her or his job 
uh, that the journalism that they do should in some ways undermine or weaken the government. That's also not journalism, is it? No, it's activism. It's got nothing to do with journalism. These are people using journalism to take a political objective forward. And they're entitled to every political objective they have. And if people want to treat them as journalists, then fair enough. But I don't actually treat them as journalists. It's easier now to say what's journalism, what's not journalism, because so many people have clearly defined political alignments. But even earlier, there were people, say, on the left, mm. who were attacking any kind of liberal government because they said it wasn't acting in the interest of the poor. And there were people on the right who were attacking it on the grounds that people who were part of this were upper middle class. And sometimes they were in the same government, like Sonia Gandhi and Manmohan Singh. No, I don't think they disagreed <laughs> very much, but yes. But your, I, I take your general point. There's always been a fringe that is motivated not by journalism, but by politics. What is the one thing you see happening around you today that you couldn't have imagined happening as an editor or you would never have allowed? No, I think the most uh, notable thing about the media scene today is the complete degradation of television. The television you started working out, working for, where you went to Cargill, for instance, and you made your reputation covering that war. Mm -hmm. But you didn't, you celebrated the heroism of our soldiers. You didn't come back and say, now we should nuke Pakistan. It was just a story for you. And you went to Pakistan, mm -hmm. you developed contacts. I think in that era, people who were in television saw journalism for what it was, so stories for what they were, and covered them on their merits. Now, I think, you if you did go to Kargil, you would come back and you'd be a Pakistan hater all your life. Your channel would have discussions on how Pakistan was responsible for everything that was going wrong in India. Mm. So you would have to be ideologically aligned. Mm. In debates, for instance, where the decline, I think, I don't do television for that reason, is the most notable. Mm. Major political parties, say the ruling party, no longer send figures of consequence to television studios. So it's always some idiot or some mm. out of work joker who's become a party mm. spokesman or some person who's been chosen because he or she has the ability to abuse and disrupt discussions. Mm. So the discussions then become these sort of shouting matches by design because nobody really wants to discuss anything. The quality of guests drops abysmally in more week by week. The anchors are often very clearly ideologically mm -hmm. aligned. And the ones who aren't, I think, are often frightened of interrupting BJP spokespeople. Has this um, ideological uh, camp uh, phenomena, <clears throat> is this a byproduct of polarization in politics or is it something else? No, it's clearly a by. It's a product of many things. I think some of it is, most of it actually, is polarization in politics. When you look at the sort of Hindu revival movement, there are many strands to it, many components to it. But one very strong strand, which we don't often recognize for what it is, is class hatred. What Manmohan Singh did in 1991 with liberalization was take many people who were not part of the traditional middle class and give them a level of prosperity. Mm -hmm. So what you now have is a new middle class, people who grew up in homes where people necessarily subscribe to what you and I would call, say, liberal values, perhaps rightly or wrongly, mm -hmm. or didn't read newspapers, who, when they've made it, who, when they have a degree of prosperity, see it as part of their job to overturn a uh, meritocracy, which they don't see as a meritocracy, in which people from educated, liberal, perhaps English-speaking backgrounds dominated. So, so much of what happens now, I mean, for example, the phrase Lachan's Delhi, mm. yeah, mm. which sometimes deliberately, but mostly mistakenly mispronounced as Lutyens, is meant as a sort of a attack not just on Delhi or on Pa. It's a because, metaphor. It's a metaphor for an English-speaking old middle class. There was a time when it was a metaphor for the people who dominated India and lived in Lachan's bungalows. Now these people are all BJP. Mm -hmm. So it, clearly they're not the ones who are being attacked. So it's become a metaphor for an old middle class. And I think a lot of this polarization you see in social media, you see in television, which is political, is also, at least at the middle class level, class-based. But do you think um, that some of the fault for not being seen today as effective messaging um, or effective messengers lies with the old liberal elites? And let me, let me elaborate on that. Yeah. We talk so much about pluralism. 
Today we all say pluralism. We don't say secularism because it's it, there's a kind of element of staleness yeah. or it, it being a corroded political slogan. But if somebody like me wanted to convince, you know, somebody I don't know that this is why pluralism is important, I don't actually have the language of faith. My parents brought me up to be somewhat deracinated. Um, I'm I'm culturally very Indian, but I'm a religious. So what I find happening is that I quote from the Indian Army, which I know better, hmm. that I've seen the Sarv Dharm Sthals there, that I've seen the Mandir Masjid Gurdwara models there. But I don't have any language of faith of my own. So I guess what I'm saying is the old elite that you and I may be classified as, the old liberal elite, are we also to blame for never finding a language that a greater number of people outside of our bubbles can relate to? No, I don't accept that because when you talk about faith, my parents were agnostics. Mm. I became a believer quite early. I now believe in God. I go to Hindu temples. I pray every single day. We have a puja room in our mm. house. My wife does an aarti every day, does lights a candle. So we are very clearly believers. Mm. So it's not that we can't communicate with people because we don't have faith. My point is that my kind of faith is very different from theirs. My kind of faith is I venerate my gods. I don't go out and kill Muslims just to say I'm being a good Hindu. Mm. That's according to me a complete perversion of Hinduism. I agree. But why did your kind of faith uh, not translate into the kind of mainstream politics that a harder version of Hinduism today is able to. But Parka, that's the same all over the world. That's like going to the Middle East and saying, why didn't liberal Islam stop the emergence of radical Islam? It's like going to America and saying, why did all these liberals allow Donald Trump mm. and the Christian right to emerge? Always an extremist religious ideology has more power in political terms. That's a global phenomenon. So what is the way to counter it then? There is no way to counter it in terms of that. You have to prove that that ideology doesn't deliver results mm -hmm. and that a liberal ideology does deliver results. The strongest argument for democracy is that it works. And that's the strongest argument for liberalism as well, that the least people suffer. But that takes time. You're seeing it in America where Donald Trump may well be back. And if he's not back, Ron DeSantis, who's probably even more dangerous, will be back. You're seeing this all across the Middle East. So we, I think we sometimes see ourselves in isolation. We're not. We're part of a global trend. As part of this global trend, um, how has politics today change the compact of the citizen and state than when maybe you were younger? Well, we like to be rosy eyed about when we were younger. But I mean, the parallel with politics today is essentially Indira Gandhi without dynasty, but radical Hinduism. It's exactly the same way in which we, things are run. We forget that Mrs. Gandhi, even before the emergency, had subverted many of the institutions of governance. We talk now about what Rijuju is saying about the Supreme Court, which frankly is scandalous. But we forget there's nothing compared to what Indira Gandhi did to the Supreme Court, where she promoted people out of, uh, out of turn, where her favorites became Supreme Court judges. We forget that in that day and age, the most powerful man in India was not one of her ministers, it was a PA, R.K. Dhawan. Mm. We forget what the Indian system underwent in those days. We see her now in a different light because there wasn't a communal element to what she was doing. and But she did give us dynasty. Yeah. So I don't think the things have changed necessarily as much as we like to pretend they have. I mean, liberals go back to that, like to think that we were a wonderful democracy. And then these chaps came along and spoiled everything. It's not true. We were not always a wonderful democracy. There were always bumps along the road. Talking about democracy, um, I was actually looking at an old speech that Indira Gandhi made in the 1970s, I think 77 to be precise, where she is actually speaking about foreign interference and foreign critics. And I found uh, I found that reference very, very uh, interesting because of the ongoing uh, debate, whether it's around George Soros or whether it's around the West commenting on democracy or whether it's, uh, or, you know, Western media and the way they look at us. And Indira Gandhi is basically lashing out and saying we will not let foreigners um, actually diminish the potential of India. And if I, if you shut your eyes, this could well be 
Prime Minister Modi making the same speech or his supporters. Or or Barkhadat writing to the Washington Post. Yeah. Well, you know, I don't. I'm not a, a believer in the foreign hand, so yeah. to speak. I don't. I don't feel that there's a conspiracy out to diminish India. My argument is quite simply that. I find there's an absence of granularity in how the Western media reports uh, India quite often, not always. Granularity is one of those words I've never understood. What does it mean? Uh, it means that you're talking about Amrit Pal Singh uh -huh. and you are going to be more focused in your coverage on the fact that internet has been shut for two or three days in Punjab than on the fact that he is trying to raise a private militia. Yeah. No, there I think you're right. Yeah. I think that was true of the way in which the Khalistan movement was covered in the 1980s as well. Yes, you're right. Our Atik Ahmed, uh, who's, who undoubtedly Form we should be asking Slain questions. Slain lawmaker, as they describe him, yeah. It's irritating, right? Or the broad stroke about But, I mean, you, you, you write for foreign publications. The argument would be, and somebody will question them, how are you calling him a criminal? What crimes was he convicted of? Whereas lawmaker is safe. He was indisputably a I know, but 10 judges uh, refused to try his case. He was charged with murder yes, when I, he was I 17 I agree with you. I find those standards with the American press. The British press don't have them absurd. But they have them. And they have them in all cases, even in America. So, so I remember when I was young, and I was in New York, and they were prosecuting Charles Manson, hmm. who'd been responsible for all these grisly murders of Sharon Tate and others. And I was appalled as a child even, that the New York Times forever referred to him as Mr. Manson and his alleged crimes. That's the way American journalism works. Yeah, but I think the point that I'm making, and I'll come back to the fact that I don't believe that there's a foreign conspiracy out to diminish India. I simply believe that it's annoying for the Americans, uh, where there have been 146 and counting shootouts this year, where women don't have basic abortion rights, where this racism is entrenched. But there's a lot more to America. I studied there. I love a lot of things about America. And I think it would be sometimes nice to see a reflection of India in all of its shades. So by all means, do talk about the absence of a Muslim member of parliament from the BJP. By all means, do talk about the uh, fourfold increase in the cases by the enforcement directorate, most of them against the opposition. Mm -hmm. By all means, call out hate speech. But there are other things happening here as well. And there's an asymmetry of power. We, our government, whoever it may be, doesn't comment on the re you know Trump being arrested. Imagine if the MEA spokesperson said we're extremely concerned that Donald Trump has been arrested. You know, this is not how we think politicians should be treated. I mean, that would be the equivalent, no? Yeah, this is supposed I mean, to be I mean, me it's, it's, you, but anyway. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. I, I know. I've read the article. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a little complicated because during the time that. I mean, first of all, people forget that while Mr. Modi's government may have ordered an IT raid on the BBC, Indira Gandhi actually expelled the BBC. And they exp she For two years, if I'm not wrong. Yeah. And she expelled the BBC on the flimsiest of pretexts. The BBC had been attacking her. She didn't want to be seen as concerned about that. So the BBC Two, I think it was, the television channel in England, screened a series of films called Phantom India, I think it was called, mm. by Louis Malt, the distinguished mm. French filmmaker. And she said they're anti-Indian mm. and asked them to suspend the telecast. And of course, they said, take a flying leap, we're not going to do that. At which stage, she threw out the correspondent. This was accompanied with the kind of statement you hear now about, you know, they're imperialists, they're white people, they can't stand the fact that brown people have got so far, etc. So nothing changes. Mrs. Gandhi actually went further than this government has because she continually asserted that there was a CIA plot to destabilize her government. And as you mentioned the phrase, the foreign hand was her pet phrase. Now, all of us then said, you're lots and stop blaming the foreign hand. If you remember, Pilu Modi once wore a badge to parliament saying, I am a CIA agent, because there was such a joke about how she was yeah. seeing CIA agents yeah. elsewhere. The irony is that if you read books about the CIA, the CIA was active in India in the 1970s. Mm. They were doing things. They you mean were. She wasn't wrong. She wasn't totally wrong. She wasn't totally Entirely wrong. wrong. But yeah. by saying this, she completely discredited anyone who was trying to do a dispassionate investigation yeah. by the CIA yeah. because she did it all as, and the KGB, which was also very active during that period, because she raised it to these levels of hysteria. But essentially, and I remember my parents, who were people who remembered the freedom movement, used to look at the foreign press with the view that the foreign press is out to get in there. And these people have never accepted that we are independent and we are capable of doing things. So yes, there has always been that criticism. In 1980, 
81. I took a year off and I traveled through America and England talking to newspaper editors to try and find out if it was true, if they were prejudiced against India. Mm. And the answer was that the Brits, yes, may well have been prejudiced, but that India was not a place they took seriously unless it was a flood, mm. a famine or a drought or a shooting. The Americans, the essential problem was they didn't know where India was and they didn't care. And when I remonstrated, I remember then with the editor of Newsweek, and I said, shouldn't you pay more attention to India? He said, shouldn't you pay more attention to South America? Can you show me a single story about South America in any of your papers? It wasn't a good argument, but I could see what he was saying. So yes, I mean, we've always had this feeling, and I share your views, that there is something crazy about a country where there are all these gun deaths coming and lecturing us about what's happening. But on the other hand, when the emergency occurred and when the foreign press wrote about us and when Mrs. Gandhi finally was shamed into calling an election, we didn't think it was such a bad thing either, did we? Do you believe Prime Minister Modi is bothered? Oh, he's very bothered. By the Western press? Of course he is. Bothered in which way? In I, think, I think Mr. Modi to has... To convert it, it into a clever othering of the media no, no, as he's done in the Gujarat context? No, I think he's genuinely bothered. I think the Prime Minister has achieved whatever he had to achieve in the Indian context. He is the most popular leader India has ever seen. He is more popular and for longer than Indira Gandhi. Mm -hmm. Indira Gandhi's popularity never lasted this long. There are not that many mountains left for him to climb in India. There is, however, the opportunity to be a global statesman. And that is something he seems quite keen on. And if you look at the way in which his acolytes, that is, uh, pet media report his adventures, he is being projected as a global statesman. Mm. Can you really do that when all of the world's great television channels and newspapers are saying you're anti-democratic, you're a Putin in the making, you're an Erdogan in the making? Mm. So clearly he's unhappy about it. It doesn't suit his image. It suits his politics, I would say, on home turf. It 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 how, sort of reinforces yeah. his nationalist. Look at look at Foreign Minister Jay Shankar. What you know, even those who don't vote for the BJP, I I have seen people sort of go three cheers for Jay Shankar when he calls out Western hypocrisy. There is a there no, no, is look, domestic yes, appetite but, for but that. But can you tell me somebody who was not going to vote for Modi who was voting for him because he did a raid on the BBC? It doesn't make any difference. It's good stuff for you and I to discuss. Hmm. But in terms of voting attentions, in terms of movement on the ground politically, it makes no difference. Okay, so let's push your, your argument a bit further. If Mr. Modi was that bothered by how yeah. the world's media, or at least the Western world's media, was perceiving him, he would ensure changes. He would I, ensure I, changes. For example, why would you give someone a chance to say the BJP has no Muslims in parliament? Just a simple thing. You could change, they could change that easily. They don't I think you will change it. I think the outreach to Christians is an attempt on the because they believe that mm. these chaps are Christians, these Western media people, so they'll care mm. more about Christians. Mm. This is a fairly primitive level. Mm. But at least the beginning of that has happened. They've tried the stick. It hasn't worked. Mm. So I think there will be some reforms because, frankly, there's so much quelling of dissent that is unnecessary. Mr. Modi is so far ahead of everyone that a little criticism actually makes him look even stronger. He doesn't really, they don't really need to terrorize the news media in the way they have. And my sense is that assuming Karnataka isn't a disaster for them, and it might be, in which case they'll get frightened. If it isn't, if they do okay in Karnataka, there will be some attempt to show the world that, look, we are an open society. Hmm. Now, you warned against the kind of sepia-toned look back, yeah. um, you know, at times that was simpler, better, kinder. Uh, and I wasn't even suggesting that. And therefore, my next question is actually about political pressure. Uh -huh. When you look back, uh, you know, at your years as, 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 an, uh, you know, as an editor, what was the tougher story for you to actually oversee? Well, there were many tough stories. And I have to say that my owners resisted the political pressure. There was, when I was editor of the Hindustan Times, a shootout in Kashmir. Mm. And the story had given out by the government was that terrorists had come into a CRS. CIS, CRPF camp, I think it was, mm. or maybe it was BSF, mm. and had opened fire and had killed various Juans. Mm. A guy who worked for the Hindustan Times, who was in fact a Kashmiri called Jay Rana, dug around and he found that many of the injuries were from rifles that had only been issued to the soldiers. So what had happened was it was so ineptly handled mm. that they shot their own people in the crossfire or mm. friendly fire. Mm. We ran the story, we were called Anti-national. Anti-national, mm -hmm. you guessed it. Yeah. But to the credit of my owners, they didn't stop me. 
We did another story about the massacre in a shopping mall in Delhi, in Anzal Plaza. Mm. Well, not a massacre. We called it a massacre. It was, according to them, an attempt to foil a deadly threat. Mm. Just before Diwali, the Delhi police put out that three men had arrived and had tried to plant bombs in Anzal Plaza. But an intrepid police team, which just happened to be on the side, had met them and had shot them. It was a good story. Mr. Advani congratulated them and thanked them for saving Diwali in Delhi, etc., etc. The problem was they were unable to come up with any credible story of where was the bomb, how did they found, they found these guys, where was the Delhi police. And we found eyewitnesses mm. who said the Delhi police team had turned up, had brought these three guys in a car, had taken them out and then shot them. And then later claimed it was an encounter now. No judgments to be passed. Maybe the Delhi police were telling the truth. Maybe the eyewitnesses were lying. But I thought it was important to cover the story because nobody else was. And we ran it on page one of the Hindustan Times day after day. I think we got enormous pressure. Arun Jaitley, who was a friend of mine and a friend of my owners, called me anti-national. But we ran it and nobody stopped me. You speak about Arun Jaitley being a friend. Uh, yeah. Do you think today... Uh, there are still friendships between politicians and journalists? Yeah, in the case of Arun Jaitley, it's slightly different because when I knew Arun Jaitley, he was a very minor figure in the BJP. I was doing a show called A Question of Answers mm. and we started inviting him to be BJP spokesperson, though there was no concept then of official spokespeople mm. or whatever. And he was very articulate. And I think Vajpayee noticed him. And as a consequence of that, they included him in the cabinet as INB minister, I think it was, even though he wasn't an MP and they got him mm. in. So I knew him before his rise to fame. But yeah, I imagine that's true. Madhavrao Sinder was a friend of mine from the time I was at Oxford University. He continued to be my friend even when he was in politics. We didn't always agree on politics. Jetley and I didn't agree on very much. But it's possible. It may be harder now because... This government is not that wild about people consorting with journalists who don't agree with them, but it's not impossible. You know, anyone who's read your memoirs, yeah. uh, you've known many politicians very well, yeah. not just professionally. Um, Sonia Gandhi, Rajiv Gandhi, Atal Bihari Vajpayee, um, Jetli, whom you just mentioned, Arun Jetli, um, and others. Uh, who do you think was the most prickly about criticism or is the most prickly about criticism? Of the ones who were my friends, uh, lots of them, mother of Sindhya, was notoriously sensitive. Even if a bad picture appeared, he would sort of complain about it. But the good thing was that they would complain and they would forget about it. They would never hold it against mm. you. Uh, I'm trying to think who else? Rajiv Gandhi who was quite prickly about criticism. But again, it would be one little explosion and then it would go I away. mean, he had a terrible bill to control the press. Yeah, it was un unforgivable. Unfortunately, yes. he withdrew it. Yeah. Manmohan Singh could not tolerate criticism from any quarter. Really? He was and, so and roundly bore, criticized and bore, the and bore, and bore the grudge till the end. Really? Yeah. You didn't mention Sonia Gandhi. Sonia Gandhi doesn't care. You can say what you like about her. She's, you forget how much she was abused when she came into politics. Huh? And if she was really that sensitive, she would have left. She took it. I remember one of the first interviews she did. I said to her that Bal Thakare has said about you that you're not really a leader. You're a reader because you read all your speeches. And to my horror, she started giggling and said, that's very funny. So she learned by then to take it. Funny. <laughs> yeah, but I can't imagine today, yeah. uh, you know, you, you, you've mentioned the BJP being yeah. uh, intolerant. I can't imagine Rahul Gandhi, for example, giggling about something rude that is said about him. No, I can't, I can't either. Yeah. So maybe there is a generational change. Maybe he's... But on the other hand, Rahul has been attacked and criticized so much that maybe he's just got ultra-sensitive. I don't know. I haven't met him for a very long time. Do you think all politicians yeah. want to muzzle the media? Or do you think some are genuinely more relaxed about criticism? All politicians say they want a free press, A. B, this free press should always praise them. <laughs> C, when the free press does not praise them, then they react in different ways. Yeah. Some get annoyed, some laugh it off, some bear grudges, and some then, as you say, try and muzzle the media. What is the toughest interview that you've done? You know, the tough interviews are never people, you're a journalist, you'll know this, are never with people who are going to be hostile to you because the people start shouting at you. It makes for very good television, yes. so, and you'll keep your cool yes. and respond. The worst interviews are with people who don't say anything. 
Or who never drop their mask. Yeah, like God. No, that you, mask, that you can get around. It's just people who don't answer questions. If you say things like, for instance, is it true that you were a contender for the prime ministership and that you only dropped out because they said they would reveal things about your private life? How would you respond to that criticism? Yeah, it's not true. <laughs> Where do you go from there? <laughs> so how, do, how do you respond I, to this? I I it's like Muraji Desai, yeah. when he was prime minister, he was the most, I interviewed him later, but he was the most frustrating man to interview. I remember he came out of talks in London with, after the Commonwealth meeting, and they said to him, you spoke to the British prime minister. He said, yes. And they said, were you happy prime minister with the outcome of the talks? And he said, I am happy in all circumstances. <laughs> so, <laughs> Yeah. I once interviewed Narasimha Rao. He'd just become prime minister. Mm -hmm. And he was like Muraji. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't give an answer to any question. And if you asked him a question that was hostile, he would give some sphinx-like answer. Mm -hmm. And then when you moved on the next, you could see his whole body relax like he just dodged a bullet. Mm -hmm. I mean, he got more comfortable with the post later. But at the beginning, he was very, very difficult. To I think in your memoirs, you wrote about profiling Amitabh Bachchan. And you, you mentioned that you could never get very much out of uh, Mr. Bachchan in an interview. So you actually hung around on the sets and spent time with him and then, you know, got to know him better. Yeah. But I find him uh, actually uh, so controlled in an interview that you can't, it's very difficult to get him to say something he doesn't want to say. Yeah, but that's a reflection of what he's like in real life. Is it? He is very controlled in real life. You will never get him to say anything unguarded. Even when he's relaxed, I think he's very, very careful. You ask people, what have you heard Amitabh Bachchan say bad about people, other people? You rarely get anything because he may hit them, but he won't let you know. Hmm. He, was, he's he, very he, he, he was your friend as well. Yes, he was. And and I think I remember you before wrote, he joined politics. To be yeah, fair. and I, and one of the things you said was that it was a mistake for him to join politics. And yeah. I asked you this back when your memoirs came. And I'm going to try it again because sometimes with the passage of time, people are willing to say more. Does anybody know why he fell out with the Gandhis? Nobody. Do you know? Nobody. Neither side. I mean, I've asked. I'll, initially, you try and be polite, and you think it'll come out. And ultimately, it had just gone on too long. So I asked both sides. And they had no answers. What do you mean they had no answers? Why are you not friends? You ask Amitabh Bachchan. Why are you and the Gandhis not friends any longer? No, we're friends. Isn't there a problem between you two? No, there isn't. Where do you go after that? When you look back at that moment, which, you know, it may be a political detail, but one remembers it well, when Sonia Gandhi uses a sort of technicality and Jaya Bachchan against Jaya Bachchan in parliament. That was how the story played out. And everybody said, this goes back, this is vendetta, this goes back to, you know, old grouses. Did you see it like that? No, I don't think so. I, I don't think, from what little I've seen Mrs. Gandhi, I don't think she's particularly obsessed with Jaya Bachchan. And when, if you remember, we were talking about the Office of Profit Issue, when they turned it around on her. And she had to then No, she didn't have to because Manmohan Singh said, I will pass an ordinance and I'll make sure you don't have to. And that's what the media were told, if you remember. And I told you she would, if you remember that. I do remember. That, that she would never do it. She would much rather resign. She resigned for another election. So what, why, why do you think that entire issue erupted at all? I don't know. I don't know the genesis of the issue. But I mean, given the way she behaved afterwards, etc., I doubt very much if it was something as petty as wanting to get jail. Mm. That's not her style. No? No. In all the things she's done, it's very hard to find any kind of vindictiveness. So... Look at Sharad Pawar, mm -hmm. who said the most terrible things about her. And when they had to form the UPA, she went to her. But that she, could be pragmatic. Yeah, but, but throughout the time in office, people said she will take him back and will humiliate him. She continued to be very respectful of him. How do you find Rahul Gandhi different from Sonia Gandhi? Only in the sense that I really don't know Rahul Gandhi. I think he's different from Sonia Gandhi in that he's a talker and he's not a listener. If you go to meet Sonia Gandhi and unless you find her in a good mood and she opens up, she's very content to listen to people, to get various people from all around to give her opinions. And then she makes up her mind based on all that. From what little I've seen of Rahul Gandhi, he's not that keen to meet people from all points of view. And when he does meet people with a point of view, mm -hmm. he lectures them. Has that happened to you? Happened to everyone. No, but has it happened to you? No, I'm not in politics. What did he lecture you I'm not in politics, so he didn't what, have to lecture what, me. What did he lecture you on? 
No, he's, I'm not in politics. He hasn't lectured me, but I've heard enough people from politics telling me that when they go to see him, it's hard to get a word in edgewise because he just talks like he has all the answers, mm. which is the opposite of Sonia Gandhi. It is not my case that he's wrong or that Sonia is right, but they're just very different that way. Mm. He's different from his father that way too because his father wouldn't lecture people. No? No. Not if there's all. one way in which politics has changed, yeah, what is that? Oh, hard to say. I think the media have changed a lot. Mm -hmm. I think there's a difference in the way in which the relationship between the media and politics has developed. Mm -hmm. In Mrs. Gandhi's time, there was no media, so as to speak. There are a few special correspondents for dailies based in Delhi. Now, of course, the media is much more complex. So was Mrs. Gandhi more autocratic? Was then, Mrs. Gandhi the most autocratic prime minister India has had? I think it would be a tough fight between her and Narendra Modi, one of the two. But her record on media is worse. Her record on media is much worse than Mr. Modi. And she, till the end, had this conspiracy theory view and she believed the press was out to get her. Mm. She believed the Americans were out to get her. Mm. That we know. Mm. But she also believed that the media were out to get her. So with Mr. Modi, the yeah. adversarial uh, relationship, the hostility for the media goes back to Gujarat 2002. Yeah. Uh, before that, you know, I remember him being a general secretary of the BJP yeah. at the BJP headquarters, quite approachable, quite yeah. accessible, quite affable even. For Mrs. Gandhi, what was the reason? I don't know is the honest answer. She believed, I mean, I think she was always, I didn't obviously know her because we're different generations, but from whatever I've been told, she was a sort of sullen, brooding presence that even in conversations, she would say, meet a head of state. And halfway through, she'd run out of things to say. And then she wouldn't make any effort to keep the conversation going. And if, say, the foreign minister was in the room, he'd desperately try to interject something. She was like that. She really didn't seem to like people very much. She had a few close friends. She was always willing to believe the worst of people. Mm -hmm. She was always willing to, willing to believe that they had it in for her. I think it got worse during the Congress split in 1969, mm -hmm. when I think everybody in the media opposed her and said what she was doing was very wrong. And her father had coined the term the jute press because most of the people who owned newspapers were Marwadis and jute patterns from Calcutta. Mm. And so jute, jute, he played on mm. it. She brought that back. And because she was then a lefty and was pretending to care about socialism, etc., mm. she said they had it in for her because she was bringing in Samajwad, was trying to help the poor. And the relationship never really improved after that. She saw herself in that phase as the socialist champion under attack from the capitalist press. And then later she added that the capitalist press was backed by the CIA. For instance, Socialist International, I don't even remember it. Yeah. It was an organization in the 1970s yeah. or so, vaguely socialist parties in Europe. And George Fernandez was a leading light of it. And she continued to believe that George Fernandez was a foreign agent because he was part of Socialist International. And every time you explain to her that you know, it was a socialist organization, no, foreign front. In 19, I forget, 87, 88, 88 or 89, Rajiv Gandhi banned Amnesty International from coming to India and going to Kashmir. I mean, and, I'm just smiling because it, this could all be the headlines of now. This is what I'm trying to explain to people, forget yes. this. And I said to him, I said, what do you gain by banning Amnesty International? And he said, well, no, what, what's happening in Kashmir is terrible, etc. And you have to be careful. So I said, but Amnesty International? Yeah, it's a CIA front. So I'm sorry, how is Amnesty International the CIA front? He said, ah, you're very naive. Amnesty International was set up by the West to complain about human rights abuses in Soviet bloc. That's been its job ever since. And now the Soviet bloc is collapsing. They're turning their attention to us. So I said, listen, I'll be following Amnesty International. Whatever else it is, it's yeah. not a CIA yeah. front. So he laughed pityingly and we left it at that. You know, the reason I'm laughing is not to trivialize what's happening in Kashmir then or now, but, but, but to but say that this could be it, it, that's exactly today's headline, that's my, that's right? My, that's my point. Nothing changes. So then all the sort of hand-wringing over how much India has changed. Has India changed? 
But media, <laughs> yes. Has India changed? Well, of course it's changed in the sense that we are all more prosperous now. We seem to matter more in the global context. Yes. Given that America needs to contain China, India becomes much more important than sure. it used to be. So in a global context, in a capitalist context, we're much larger market than we used to be. So yes, India is much more important. But in terms of politics, I mean, there are bumps along the road. The faces change, the names change, but the story is much the same. But the editorial is being written in the Financial Times and the Washington Post but just this, this week. But hang on, they wrote them for Mrs. Gandhi too. You just don't remember. So that's my question to yeah. you. That is it so different today than it was earlier? I think it is in one important sense, and yes. I don't, and I cannot emphasize this enough, which is that whatever you thought of Mrs. Gandhi, she never questioned the pl pluralistic structure of India. She never believed that you could play majoritarian politics. Yeah, I think that's what's being played now. And I think that's dangerous and it has serious consequences for the future of India. Purely in practical terms, forget all this, we are secular and we are nice to minority stuff. But if 15% of the population feels it has no stake in the future of India, how can you run this country? The Sikhs were 2% of the population in 1980. And when some of them, a minority, because the majority of Sikhs never agreed with this, yeah. felt they had no stake in India, look at the havoc that was wreaked. And there I blame Mrs. Gandhi, but I think she learned from that lesson. And if the Congress had continued doing what she wanted to do, which I think Arun Nehru and Co. wanted Rajiv to do, which is why they opened the locks of the Babri Masjid, etc., this would have happened earlier. It is to Rajiv's credit, and he's never actually got the credit he deserves for this, that he walked away from the Hindu vote, which the Congress had got in the 84 election. Hmm. So it's so interesting you say that, because I was going to, while taking your the larger point of your argument, give you those two examples, not so much to you, but to our audience. One that Indira Gandhi was accused of creating a Bhindran Wale, whom she, she then had to send the army yes. after. Um, Rajiv Gandhi was accused of flirting with the Hindu vote. Narasimha Rao was accused of doing absolutely nothing. There have been massive anti-Muslim riots that have taken place on the Congress watch. There has been the anti-Sikh program in Delhi, which has taken place on the Congress watch. So when you say the Congress is or Mrs. Gandhi has not played communal politics. Is that strictly true? I think that was completely true until we get to Punjab. And I think part of the problem was that Mrs. Gandhi never really saw Sikhs as being non-Hindus. She didn't see it as being communal politics. She saw it as being regional politics. Mm -hmm. You put up somebody to destabilize the Tamil Nadu government. Mm -hmm. It was that kind of thing. Various people, I think denied being one of them, but he possibly was. Various people told her that the only way to counter the Akalis is to create a Sikh religious force that supports the Congress. That is why Binran Wale was found and went ahead. Yeah. Having done that, I think she lost control. Binran Wale turned into a Frankenstein's monster. She then mm -hmm. handled the Punjab agitation incredibly badly. Mm -hmm. There were many times when the army should have gone in, when Atwal was killed, for instance, his body was lying in the mm -hmm. Golden Temple. Mm -hmm. She delayed for too long. She relied on Sundarji, who really massively screwed up the operation. Mm -hmm. And she chose the wrong day when there were pilgrims there because it was a holy day. Do you day. think Star was a mistake? Oh, Rooster, the way it was done, was one of the greatest disasters of Mr. Gandhi's time. I said that at the time when everybody was going rah rah and cheering, mm -hmm. that we were in even deeper trouble after Blue Star, because till that point, even moderate Sikhs who disapproved of Bindran Wale. Kushwan Singh is one example. He returned as Padma Bhushan, do you remember? I do remember yeah? that, yeah. These were not communal Sikhs or Khalistanis. Even they were horrified by what she did. I mean, Amrinder Singh at that point. He like, yeah, Amrinder, who was Rajiv's school friend, left the Congress. Yeah. Yeah, so Bruce was a terrible tragedy and a terrible mistake. And whose mistake was it? Indira Gandhi's. And she miscalculated, misread, misunderstood? I wasn't there, but I suspect a combination of all of them. Hmm. So therefore, She was also misled by the army. In India, you can't ever say the army got anything wrong. But you can just contrast Blue Star with Operation Black Thunder, hmm. which happens a few years later hmm. and is conducted by the NSG and the Punjab police, which is incredibly effective. Mm. It was, we should never have relied on the army. It's not the army's job to do these things. The army doesn't know how to do it. But the army may not have chosen. They were following instructions, right? Yeah, but the army said afterwards that we have no experience of fighting insurgencies, etc. To which the counter was, that's pretty much all you've done. What did you do in Nagaland? What did you do in Mizoram? So the Indian army has been fighting insurgencies from 1940. But not their choice, right? Yes, but 
if the Indian army had protested, etc., they would have done what they did later. They created the NST, they created all these commando organizations. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Gandhi realized, and Nehru realized, after 1962, when IB didn't give them enough intelligence, mm -hmm. in 66 or 67, Mrs. Gandhi created RNAWN. Mm -hmm. So when you see that there is a problem, you create a new organization. Nobody in India realized there was a problem. They were quite happy letting the army do it. And the army, as far as I know, didn't complain then. Mm -hmm. Everyone has a favorite news assignment or a story yeah. they've overseen. When I say favorite, it could be something distressing, depressing, but the most fulfilling, the yeah. most rewarding. I don't have one if that's if that's where we're going. How come? I never have favorites. I don't have favorite cities, favorite friends, favorite books, favorite movies, favorite things. I take each day as it comes. Is there a phase of your journalistic life that stays with you more than others? No. I mean, people keep saying to me that turning the HT around should mm. be something I'm incredibly proud of, frankly. Or Sunday? Yeah. But frankly, I never even think about those things. You're asking me, so we're going back into history, but I'm very much a guy who lives in the present. I rarely think back. So what was the last interesting, you know, story that excited you? I don't do stories. Anymore. I know, but I don't you consume stories. them. You're, you're, you know, once a journalist, always a journalist. I think many of the stories that are coming out of India are not exciting. They're depressing. Mm. So it's often a very depressing experience to read the newspapers. Mm. A, because of what they're reporting. And B, because of the way in which it's being reported. Mm. The level at which it's being discussed. Mm. One reason I admired your COVID reporting so much was because you were telling stories people didn't want heard. Mm. Yeah. Thank you for that. But let me ask you something that um, that I think I grapple with. But when I look at some of the positions you've taken in your columns and so on, yeah. I'm struck by the fact that the right wing certainly doesn't like you, but this you're not right. left of center. You have, uh, no, no. You, you know, you're socially I'm a liberal. free market liberal, shall we say? Yeah. yeah. But those terms aside, yeah. there's a lot of pressure on people right now. People, not just yeah. journalists, but people. Yeah. To choose sides. Yeah. And, and there are those among us who choose sides based as an issue as opposed to a blanket side. Correct. So I don't agree with this with this idea that just because you're not left or right, you're fence sitters. You take a position on the issues that matter to you and you take them issue by issue. Do you see yourself as more left or right? I don't even know what these terms mean. I mean, in the colloquial way that they use, not in their sort of if classic... You, uh, you see, in India, right has come to mean the Hindutva chaps. So obviously and left, Hindutva. and left is everybody else. <laughs> so it does, it's, it's become completely meaningless. I once had a column on it. Yes. Because by most definitions, Mr. Modi is the most left-wing prime minister we've had. Because he believes in government control of everything. He believes in big government. He believes in welfare. Mm -hmm. Just because his party doesn't like Muslims doesn't necessarily make him right-wing, no? Hmm. How do you see yourself? I don't see myself as either left or right. I see myself as a liberal who believes in liberal values and who, as you said, makes up his mind depending on what happens. For instance, I was quite optimistic about Rahul Gandhi when he came into politics. And then, as you may have seen, I did many sharply critical columns of him because I believed he was in the process of destroying the Congress Party. Hmm. Now that he stepped back, there's allowed elections to happen. And the Bharat Jodo Yatra, I thought, mm. was a positive move. I'm more supportive. But I think that's how it should be. You should look at individuals and events and make up your mind on the basis of that. You shouldn't say, I'm Congress, I'm BJP. That's not what, I mean, forget journalism. That's not what any intelligent person should do. But there is also such a thing as having a sense of, I mean, we're a very big country. To have yeah. a sense of the people is very difficult. But there are certain issues on which I think a lot of Indians have commonsensical responses. They don't actually see them in the way journalists and politicians Such as left. The flag, the yeah. anthem, right? Yeah. I, uh, the military. Yeah. Um, Pakistan. Yeah. Even this intuitive bristling at uh, why is America lecturing us? This is, it doesn't actually matter which way you vote. Yeah. Most people would respond in a certain way in which I think that, you know, if there's a far right and a hard right, there is now also a far left and a left that is removed from that, that, that tactile sense of how regular folks think and feel. Do you think the left counts for anything? I don't know. The disproportionate noise in social media, at least, is by the right and the left. It's not by regular folks. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't waste much time thinking about the extreme left or the noisy left. It's noisy, but it doesn't count for anything. It's 
been finished off in West Bengal. It survives as a not very leftist force in Kerala. Mm. Otherwise, it's of no consequence in Indian politics. Well, okay. Even the ideas that the left would have claimed saying we should do more welfare, we should have more government control of big business, Mr. Modi has told it. So what are the left yeah. stand But you know, I once used to say in the media context that you don't have to be an Ornav Goswami or an Arundhati Roy. Like, I don't think Indians identify with either of yeah. these extremes. But our conversation, our public discourse today is pushing us to choose these extremes. How Nobody, some- nobody's pushing us. I think we allow ourselves to go with the flow. Hmm. I don't think like, for instance, I've, you've done a column just now saying that the Western media doesn't understand that the more that it criticizes India, the more it gets our backs up. And instead of seeing it as a force for good, Mm. we see it as an interfering hypocritical force. I'm sure that's not made you very popular among people. I've done a column that appeared day before yesterday. On Atik Ahmed. On on the encounter saying that, look. Indians are not bloodthirsty. Indians are not bloodthirsty. The system has failed. You can't deliver justice. Can you get self-righteous about ordinary middle class people who don't think an encounter is such a bad thing? Of course, it's a bad thing. And I've listed why it's a bad thing. But I don't think you should condemn people for saying that. Now, that's not a left point of view or a right point of view. View, nor is your point of view in America or whatever. So it is possible to take stands on issues that may be at odds with the conventional wisdom. But if you argue them well as you did that piece, I think I hold up. How do you deal with noise on social media? I don't. Just block them. Yes. Block or mute? No, no. Mute, block. Why should I mute them? <laughs> because block is giving some of the importance of your even. No, he doesn't, even, he doesn't know again what I've seen. Look, first of all, at least 60 to 70% of the people who troll me are organized, right? Mm. Either they're bots or they come from troll farms mm. or they're two rupee wallers. Mm. You can't really, if you block them, then they can't get their two rupees for attacking you. So you gain that way. Finally, one thing that um, gives you great hope for India and one thing that makes you very anxious, concretely, I don't mean meta. The same, th- the same thing, yeah. the same thing. The thing that gives me great hope for India is the new generation. We all keep saying we're a very young country. Yeah. That's true. Our demographics have changed dramatically. This is an educated, new emerging class that is world class in many ways that benchmarks itself against the world and which I hope will power India in this century. So that gives me a lot of hope. What depresses me is that many of these people, while they've measured success in material terms, haven't really realized what makes India work as a country. And we are therefore in danger of throwing it away. Thank you, Veer. Uh, I always tell everybody you have the best stories and the best way of telling them. So I think you should have your own show soon. I hope you do. I know you do something with the print, but like a longer, deeper set of conversations would be great. Thank you so much. Thank you.